Aloha, my name is Michael Palmieri. I'm the Executive Director of Creative Lab Hawaii. On behalf of Georgia Skinner, Chief Officer of the State of Hawaii DBED Creative Industries Division and founder of Creative Lab Hawaii, Mahalo for participating in our Zoom webinar on options co-sponsored by California Lawyers for the Arts. In a moment, I will introduce our presenter, though I first wanted to share with you a little bit about our webinar. Our presentation will last approximately 40 to 45 minutes, which will leave us 10 to 15 minutes for questions from our viewers. If you're interested in asking questions, please do so as the discussion unfolds. There is a, an icon at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. Click on that and write your question in and we'll be sure to get to it. Uh, at the end of the presentation, and we'll answer as many questions as time will allow. As a reminder, the series of legal clinics taking place this month are for informational purposes only. If you require specific legal advice, we recommend you consult an attorney. Now, let me introduce you to our presenter, Elsa Rama. Elsa Ramo is the managing partner of Ramo Law PC and was recently named Variety's Legal Impact Report and Dealmakers List. She annually represents over 100 films and 50 television scripted and unscripted series, including, including Emmy Award winning shows and films, which debut at renowned film festivals around the world. Elsa provides comprehensive legal services to producers, financiers, creators, and owners of film, television, and digital content and projects across a range of budgets and production levels. She established her own law firm to enable up and coming filmmakers and producers to bring their stories to life. Her clients include Imagine Entertainment, Fox, Kevin Hart's LOL Network, Balboa Productions, which is Sylvester Stallone's company, Scout Productions, who are the creators uh, and executive producers of Queer Eye, Boardwalk, Boardwalk Pictures, executive producers of Chef's Table and Skydance. Elsa dedicates substantial time to mentoring women through various organizations, and she has become a go-to commentator and instructor on legal issues related to film financing and the future of the industry. Elsa, take it away. Thanks so much, Michael. Well, thanks everybody for joining today. Um, I really appreciate being a part of this and educating those of you listening and um, just as a caveat, I'm sort of tailoring this to non-lawyers, right? We are all sort of artists trying to endeavor in the production and producing and development of content. And so really this is meant to be, um, I, as much as I possibly can, a user-friendly um, way to, to understand these concepts that as you develop and grow your career, you'll be doing in conjunction with an attorney, um, but you really have to have a basic understanding to do your best work in terms of understanding what you need from your legal advisor and what you're trying to get to. Um, and so from that point of view, we're going to be speaking today about option agreements. And um, I'm going to have you guys help uh, walk the slides with me. So I'm going to prompt the slide uh, to start. And we'll let you know when we're going to go to the next slide. So um, can you guys share the screen and we'll get started. Um, so today we're going to talk about option agreements. Um, Creative Lab has done a really good job in helping me prep for this. And so we've kind of made the decision to speak about option agreements more generically. Um, you know, when I started 15 years ago, option agreements were a vehicle and a means primarily in the feature film arena. But what we're going to be speaking about is sort of what is an option agreement in terms of acquiring or, or um, using any form of intellectual property. So that's going to be the focus of our kind of top line discussion today. And I will kind of flip flop between how that relates to film versus television versus episodic versus kind of all the other content that exists out there. We kind of live in a TikTok short form Quibi era where um, there's a lot of different ways that, that a producer can produce or a creator can create content. And so the idea is when you have an interest for a piece of IP and want to have a path to buy it, how do you do that? And that's really what an option agreement can be utilized for. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So let's go to the next slide. Um, I know you guys heard my intro, which is great. And I appreciate Michael telling that. Just to give you context of how option agreements are in my life on the daily, I represent you know, content creators, owners, producers, and financiers. So what I often do with them is help them plan and map out how can they acquire rights to something in a way that makes sense for what the ultimate financials are going to be for the show or the feature um, and how they can acquire something that at the point of being on the one yard line and having an offer from Netflix or Paramount or an independent financier that wa wants to write them a check, 
how do they present the best package possible and ensure the financier distributor studio that they have all the necessary rights to make the thing right um, so for me on the on the daily it consists of a lot of options for screenplays books articles um, right now what's become very prevalent in my practice in the past five years is i work a lot in the unscripted space so uh as we all know there you know people are obsessed with crime dramas and and worlds and universes like tiger king and so it's also uh, optioning rights has also expanded to um, life stories businesses um, things that can be depicted in the unscripted and scripted world and ultimately it's about helping come up with a strategy for the producer or acquirer of rights or if you are sort of the originator of the ip in how two parties can engage together to develop and sell something where both parties feel like there's a meeting of the minds in terms of what the expectations are when the, the piece of content is made um, so we're going to go to the next slide what i first want to kind of help frame and, and have the group understand is that um, options are kind of um, the traditional uh, formal way of endeavoring in a relationship. Um, and, and it's usually a much more uh, meticulous, heavily negotiated agreement that really kind of gets into everything. Um, so it gets into the detail of how long you're optioning the rights for, but more importantly, it kind of pre-negotiates every single aspect of the deal so that when the sale occurs, everything is done and set. Now, that is great from a producer's perspective of selling it because at the point of sale, ideally you have a fully negotiated set of understanding and terms. And so you're just able to effectively flip the switch and make the thing. What is problematic about that is that when you're a producer or a content creator, it's very hard to pre-negotiate a set of terms when you don't know how the thing is ultimately going to get made. I don't know what the budget is. I don't know if it's a, you know, a, a, a cable show that is made on the cheap. I don't know if it's like the next HBO premium cable. And so how do you negotiate terms without knowing what it ultimately is? And so before one even gets into the intricacies of what is an option, the question I ask my client and, and my sophisticated clients have learned to ask themselves is, am I really ready and do I have enough information and do I have enough leverage to negotiate a comprehensive and effective option agreement where everything is negotiated, everything is figured out, everything is sorted? Alternatively, um, I may not have money for a lot of legal fees. I may not know exactly what I'm willing to pay or not. I don't even really know what it is that I'm interested about this book. I just know that I want to develop it. An attachment agreement is kind of a, a shorthand, um, more truncated way of addressing a way in which to acquire IP where you, you're given some level of exclusivity and some level of permission to go out into the world and find the deal. And in that particular instance, there's there's a little bit of rolling up the sleeves at the deal stage where the rights holder has a seat at the table to dictate or negotiate what their terms are. So it, it is important when you're a producer in particular and you're looking at a piece of IP, a screenplay, a book, an article, to really decide, are you ready to really get into all the nooks and crannies of an option agreement? Or are you going to do more of a short form attachment agreement because you kind of just are really you really think there's viability in the market but you're not really sure kind of what to do next so we're going to go to the next slide and just kind of talk about these two because uh the, the rest of our presentation will we're kind of, we're going to kind of drill down on an option agreement but i really think it's important for those of us to understand that there there is sort of a fork in the road before getting into the nuances of an option which is or am i going to do an attachment or i'm going to do an op an option so to kind of get into the grand granularity of what I just said, right? Let's compare and contrast and let's look at these two agreements and kind of talk about that for a few minutes. And then we'll kind of shift our focus to the details around the option agreements and get much more detailed on that. So an attachment agreement generally is, is called a shopping agreement. Um, it can be a producer attachment. So a shopping agreement is, you know, I really feel like someone should make this reality show about surfing in Hawaii and this particular surfer has an interesting story. I'm going to 
you know, ask to depict you and take that and try to sell it to a network or streamer. Um, and you, you get into the nuances of the shopping agreement. A producer attachment has very similar machinations. So some of it is term of art. Some of it is just kind of has different nuances to, to what the actual agreement says. A producer attachment may be a little bit more like you have a screenplay. It's super interesting. Um, and I want to attach myself as a producer and I want you to give me the exclusive right to take it out into the world and find a director and financiers and things like that. I, as a producer, I'm gonna be attached to your IP owner. And then you have a non-circumvention. Um, you know, oftentimes those can be labeled as finder agreements. Um, usually they're the, the non-circ is, is about somebody proclaiming, right? And it's in quotes a little bit that they have the ability to find third-party financing. They have the ability to identify um, producers or executive producers or high net worth individuals they may want to fund development, production, financing, p &A, et cetera. And in exchange for facilitating those introductions, they wanna get some sort of cut, a percentage, an executive producer credit, et cetera. In that situation, right, the, the exchange, the understanding between the parties is that the producer has the exclusive right to sell or set up during the term. And if they're successful, this is how the producer's attached, but we're not getting into what the rights holder is getting, right? They're short, they're, this is kind of the point of it. Alternatively, when you're acquiring rights, right? An option agreement that I said in the beginning is, is giving you a window of time to, to buy the rights, but every element of that purchase is pre-negotiated. What you're buying, what you're paying for it, what credits you're giving, et cetera. You sort of are getting into all, all of those details. It's often called an option agreement. Um, if you're just straight up buying it, it's called a purchase agreement. So in that particular situation, the difference between an option and a purchase agreement is an option is I'm gonna give you $5 and for the next 12 months, I have the exclusive right to buy the screenplay for all of these negotiated terms. A purchase agreement is I am buying the screenplay right now and I'm giving you $10 for it. There is no time to exercise. It's just automatically happening. These are also sometimes called collaboration agreements, co-production or co-financing agreements. Those are a little bit uh, usually more complicated. Um, generally in that situation, you may have, for example, uh, a mechanism or a reason why that would be is you may have a a domiciled French production company who's partnering with a Canadian company, each party is putting in money, each party is contributing IP and they're making a movie, a TV show, et cetera. So that falls a little bit out of the purview of what we're kind of talking about today, but those are agreements where people are either jointly owning um, IP or endeavoring to assign each other a portion of their IP in order to make it. So in, in those situations, when you're acquiring rights, the owner is granting an exclusive option for a period of time, and the producer has the right to purchase the rights for preset terms agreed upon by the owner. So those are how they're distinctive. So let's just talk about sort of the benefits and burdens of an attachment in our next slide. So why, why an attachment? And, and some of this is summarizing things that we've just discussed and gone over. So the benefits, as I, as I mentioned, is it is cost effective to finalize a transaction attachment. They're much shorter, they're much simpler. You're not kind of getting into all of it. Um, it may be easier to justify a free term. So in an attachment agreement, the terms are generally shorter, um, six months, nine months, 12 months. You're, you're kind of aiming for 18 months. Those are harder to get because you're usually not paying for, an op for a term under an attachment agreement juxtaposed with an option, generally speaking, there's an expectation that you're paying money to hold for that period of time. Um, it allows for a lot of flexibility because the ultimate deal is gonna depend on whether you sold the movie for a million dollars or you're gonna make it for 30 million. And it just kind of allows it to be something you figure out at the time. What are the burdens, right? Well, there's a risk of encumbrance that the party that you're engaging with is just gonna be a royal pain at the point in which you're ready to sell. They may have completely unrealistic expectations of what they're entitled to if they're the rights holder. They may believe that their script is worth $2 million, a pony and red M&Ms in, in their trailer, right? Like, and those things, if you don't suss it out in an attachment agreement, you're kind of not gonna know until you spent six months shopping, taking it out, using your resources, 
getting an offer from a third party and then you realize you have a rights holder with an unmakeable deal. So it's a risk. Um, it also limits your ability to develop and secure financing at an early stage because, you know, if you have a, an attachment agreement for a book, and really the next step for you is to commission a writer to write a screenplay, an investor is going to be very reluctant to give you money to pay for a screenplay if the underlying rights are not fully vetted and fully negotiated under an option purchase. So generally speaking, if you're spending money during the contemplated term that's real or bringing in partners to spend development monies, it's, it's an aversion for it to be in a shopping agreement because you're taking another risk by not having a negotiated term with your rights holder. Um, it does also minimize due diligence on rights. While we often recommend that attachment rights holders do require a basic review of, of um, the chain of title and to make sure there's no encumbrances, it's not generally as thorough as when you have an option agreement where you're going to do a very thorough search of the pre-existing rights. Um, you may do a copyright search. You may really ensure that you're engaging with the right party and that party has not encumbered the rights elsewhere. Um, and it does leave financials and mutual expectations subject to negotiation. Now, I will say a workaround can be in these short form attachment agreements, you can start to articulate the expectations. You know, you, you can say to um, a screenplay rights holder, you can negotiate your rights fee, but you maintaining the right to do ongoing writing services is subject to third party approval. Uh, I, the producer, will get a producer fee and credit. And the, uh, the writer in that particular situation, we say, well, wait a second, I also want to be an executive producer. So you can um, minimize some of those risks by at least identifying roles and expectations, but still it leaves a lot of room for negotiation. So let's compare that to the benefits and burdens of an option. Let's go to the next slide. So the, the benefits are you're confirming the IP and the rights fully and completely. And I will say um, this has become an even more contested issue as of late because right, uh, deal makers, right, streamers and studios and even sophisticated financiers at the deal making stage want the broadest latitude of rights possible for a particular piece of IP. And whether it's a screenplay, a book, an article, a life rights, the idea that they don't have a 360 right to everything that is surrounding the, the, the IP or the intellectual property that's being acquired can be a real encumbrance. For example, oftentimes streamers may initially reach out and acquire the rights with the intention of making a limited docuseries. But they want to be able to know that there is the ability to make a scripted feature, scripted series, and other rights that their expectation will be that that is all fleshed out and figured out under the confines of the option agreement. The attachment agreement doesn't necessarily allow for that much detail. So in an option agreement, you're kind of getting into what, what rights are being granted. Are you reserving publishing? Are you reserving anything else? And it helps you really flesh out and understand what it is exactly that you're selling or trying to set up. As we've been talking about over and over again, it sets the price and puts the rights holder in more of a passive role. In a well-drafted, well-formulated option agreement, it really should be as simple, right, as you pay the option fee. And to exercise the option, if you have to pay $100,000, you pay that and that's it, the rights transfer. It's automatic, it doesn't require an amendment, it doesn't require further signatures. It's, it's an automatic right that the option purchaser has with the rights holder. Um, it also may avoid a secondary deal making at the later stage. So basically, the more you pre-negotiate the terms, the less likely that the rights holder is going to try to renegotiate, um, set new expectations, saying, you know, for these broader rights, I actually want double the purchase price. Or, you know, I had always expected that I was going to be a, a gross participation owner. You're just kind of getting into all the nitty gritty now. The burden is it does cost more, right? It costs more of your time. There are lawyers involved. It, it is a much more meticulous, longer, costly exercise. Um, the buyer rights holder can also ask for more that is a little bit too hypothetical in the abstract. So, you know, the, the, the flip side of pre-negotiating everything is that, you know, the author could think that they're the next Lord of the Rings, right? And they think that they should be getting $500,000 for each production made and, you know, 25% gross, et cetera, where the reality is like when you actually sell the thing, 
it may only live in a situation where it's a $500,000 an episode budget, where really a rights fee like that should be 10 or 20,000. So what sometimes does happen in the option negotiation stage is that things get stalled out. There's just a misalignment of the market reality which maybe a producer is sophisticated enough to identify and the IP rights holders expectation of what it can be. And in that situation, you do get stuck because as the producer, you do want the exclusive option. You do want to be able to move on with the deal, but you also don't want to promise something that you can absolutely never deliver. Um, and then in that situation, also of, of proceeding with the option, the upfront option fees are going to be an added cost, right? That is something you have to pay in the here and now to get all of these pre-negotiated terms. And option fees really do vary, and it does depend on, you know, the um, competitiveness of the project, the precedent that the rights holder may have on that on that piece of property or other pieces of property. But it is an added cost and something to contemplate as you're looking at kind of endeavoring on an option. So let's do a real quick sort of review of, uh, in our next slide, of attachments versus options, and then we'll kind of talk about options specifically for the duration of our class today. So as, as I mentioned, you know, the, the benefits of the attachment is it's cost effective, it's quick, it's fast. Um, and ideally, it's something that you can generate quickly. Uh, a lot of producers or packagers or financiers find this instru instrument to be highly effective to have multiple irons in the fire, right? They're not, they don't necessarily want to spend a lot of money on one or two projects a year. They kind of want to throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. And so attachment agreements, option agreements, or sorry, attachment agreements, shopping agreements can be a very quick and effective way to wrap your arms around various different rights and kind of figure out what's going to work. An option agreement um, really in the business of production companies and studios that are actually making stuff and really are either going to roll up their sleeves and spend significant monies in development and or have a very acute eye of exactly how they're going to make a thing are essential. You know, when we represent companies that are producing 10 or 15, you know, movies or, or series a year, they, they need it to be a fully fleshed out option. The one thing I will say is that options uh, traditionally at the nascent stage tend to, to skew more on the film side, narrated scripted feature. And in the TV world, things are a little bit more along the lines of an if come or attachment agreement where um, TV is about having a lot of irons in the fire and figuring out what pitch to get. And until you're kind of at a, a studio network level where someone's spending significant money to develop it or give a series order, a lot of those deals are, are probably more along the lines of an attachment or a shopping agreement. So that is also another thing to sort of consider in terms of like, what is it that you feel you're going to make with this intellectual property? Is it gonna be a scripted feature where you're gonna go more traditionally to like a Paramount or Disney? Or is it more of an unscripted series that's going to end up on Discovery Plus? And, and is that something that will get figured out on the sale? So again, these are all things that, that you have to think about where um, you're trying to figure out which way to proceed forward in acquiring the rights. So let's say you make the decision to move forward with the option itself. So um, before we do that, I'm sorry, I do have a producer attachment agreement that I put in here, but because we're focus on option agreements today. I'm just going to show you these slides and it's a good sort of thing for you to read through when you want to fall asleep reading a legal document. So I'm going to show you on the next slide the producer attachment, but we're going to get into an option. So let's go to the next slide. So this is an example of a producer attachment. Um, I mean, just to give you a sense, I was able to put it all in a, in a small number of slides, whereas with the option, I had to pick and choose like the main excerpts to, to talk about today. So here's a producer attachment. You guys can kind of look at it at your leisure and kind of see kind of just topically how much shorter it is than a full-fledged option. So you have the first page and then we're gonna go to the next slide. The second page, right? It's very simple terms. You're not getting into any level of detail. Um, and then you go to the page after and really in like normal eight and a half by 11, it's two pages, super simple, super straight to the point. And, as you can see, would not necessarily be very time intensive to get right. So because we're focused today on options, I'm going to skip forward. And obviously, if um, uh, Creative Hawaii wants to share this 
PDF they can, just so you guys have it to look at in your at your leisure kind of post class. Um, so now let's talk about the option purchase. We're going to go to the next slide. And I just want to spend uh, the rest of our time talking about very specific provisions, just so you can get a basic understanding of how they work. Um, and then we'll kind of uh, just highlight other kind of boring legal provisions that you should just be mindful of, but that we don't will not necessarily have time to drill down today. So in the next slide, the the main kind of like business points, but like legal relevant points to create the best possible option purchase agreement are going to be these categories, which we're going to go into. Um, so we'll kind of go into these slide by slide, but really from the point of view of being um, effective with your legal counsel and being a producer who's trying to frame an offer for an option or the recipient of the offer, like this could almost be the checklist of, am I addressing all of these things or not, right? Like if, unless you're really addressing all of these things, you're kind of leaving something on the table on either side of the deal. So let's go into the first section. So you have uh, in the next slide, you have two important aspects. One is what's the option period, right? So as I mentioned, the option fee can vary. Um, they can be as little as $500. I, I would say like the, the norm for whatever it means, if, if it's a median, um, and I always forget the difference between a median and an average, but whatever's like that in-between number, it's usually $5,000, a little bit more, a little bit less, depending on the competitiveness, what it is, um, who you are in relation to it, et cetera. And then you have the option term. Um, you'll see here that this is language for an initial option. Option terms generally tend to be longer than attachment terms. So I'd say 12 is on the lower side, 18 is about the sweet spot, 24 is a grab, but worth a try. Um, and generally uh, on an option, you'll wanna have at least two terms, right? So you, and they'll match. So it'll be the first term at 5,000 for 18 months, the second term for, for another 18 months at $5,000. And some of that may or may not be applicable against the purchase price. And you see that language here. The conditions precedent on the, the right side of this slide are also super relevant because again, this is a full, intended to be a fully fleshed out document. And your ultimate financier, distributor, whomever you're going to work with down the line is going to want to ensure that you don't just have the piece of paper that says that, ha that you have the rights, but that you did the diligence to ensure that you have the rights. So part of your, what your vetting will be in the option is a condition precedent where you'll check the chain of title. Um, if it's a screenplay, you may order a, a third party uh, service to get a copyright report to see if there's other filings that somehow suggest that the person that you're contracting with is not the full claimant. Um, they may have optioned it before and that prior party may have filed something with the copyright office. There may be a uh, UCC filing. So you, you'll need probably appropriate legal counsel to help vet and ensure that you're entering into the deal with the right person and you yourself should do diligence. It's amazing to me how few of my clients just don't Google search things. And it's interesting because when you just look and see, okay, I'm acquiring the book rights from this author, but I see that on Amazon, the book is actually written by two other people. Where are their deals? How do they fit into this? Do they have rights? And you ask questions. Well, they were a ghost writer. They signed a work for hire agreement. Great, send me the work for hire agreement. Let me make sure. I see Scholastic Books as the publisher. Okay, we need a publisher release. So it, it, it does become complex and, and more um, dynamic, but you really have to make sure that you're getting the rights from the right person and, and look up the story. And, and there's also other tells, right? Like you can find out that there was a variety article that they said that they were you know making this in conjunction with another partner. And you'll wanna ask well, what happened there? Oh, well, we signed an attachment agreement but never went anywhere. Okay, well, can I see that attachment agreement just to ensure that there it isn't an outstanding obligation? So the condition precedent is the fork in the road for you to do your homework and make sure you're contracting with the right people. And on the flip side, as a rights holder, you have to make sure you're able to present that in a way that's digestible because oftentimes the option term won't start until that portion is approved. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so we talked about the fact that an option is basically like a holding fee for a period of time where you can flip the switch and buy the thing, right? So to exercise the option, you have to pre-negotiate a purchase price. Um, it has to basically be the amount of money you're getting that's going to have the rights vest and sit with you. So uh, in this particular instance, this is a pretty traditional way of breaking out a purchase price. This is more focused on a 
feature um, in the sense of it's a percentage of the budget with a floor and a ceiling um, where you may end up paying a, a, a port like the floor of it as the, the thing that purchase does a purchase. So generally speaking for film, that could be anywhere between one and a half to 3% of the budget, could be a little bit more, could be a little bit less. The floor and the ceiling depends on where your budget lies. You know, is this a lifetime TV movie of the week? You know, in that case, your floor and ceiling may sit more in a, you know, WJ scale, for example, right, which is 110,000 if it's under 5 million, a little bit more if it's not, um, or it could be a much bigger budgeted thing. So the, the floor may be 250,000 with the ceiling of a million. So again, it kind of depends on what you're talking about. And it's really hard in the context of a class to, to tell you what the market rates are, but these are the things you have to consider. Um, on the TV side, generally speaking, it's a flat fee that might be tiered depending on the level of sale. So um, if you have a premium streamer like an Apple, HBO, et cetera, or even like a high level network like an ABC, NBC, that fee, that purchase price may be higher versus like if it ends up at like uh, Discovery Plus or um, even like a Viacom Plus, it might be a lower rate because generally speaking, the budgets are lower. But the idea is that once you pay that pre-negotiated purchase price, the rights that we'll talk about in a second are going to fully transfer over to the purchaser. So there's some other provisions that we're going to go into that are financial terms to be discussed. So in the next slide, another sort of um, tool in your box is an, is a setup bonus. So you might be an independent producer. You may have a lot of desire uh, to sell it, but they want to know um, if you end up, you know, knocking it out of the park and sell it, setting it up with a studio or a mini studio, they get a bonus. And so that bonus is paid out as an in-between the option fee and the purchase price, right? It's like, look, you, you now, because of this project are at Paramount or Disney or Warner Brothers or whomever. And so I want a bonus. And that bonus sometimes is or is not applicable against the purchase price. And that bonus, you know, when I started many years ago, it was 20,000 for a major, 15,000 for a mini studio. Th those numbers have fluctuated quite a bit and it kind of depends on the totality of everything else, but it's a way for a rights holder to feel like they're going to get a taste and upside, right? If it's established at a bigger studio and it gives the producer a way to give them a carrot that they don't necessarily have to pay right here and now. It's only in success that they pay this intermediary fee. So that's a setup bonus. Let's go to the next slide. So a credit bonus is really more affiliated with writing, right? You're um, acquiring a screenplay, you're acquiring a pilot. Um, it's something where someone is writing the thing that's going to get made, which is different than a book, an article, a life rights, um, a stage play underlying source material. And a credit bonus here, this is more tailored towards uh, features, but there, it's, it has very similar um, like intonations on the TV side, where basically if there's sole writing credit, there's a percentage of the budget that gets paid out on commencement of principal. And if it's shared, it gets reduced by 50%, generally speaking. Um, on the TV side, that can sort of translate into what's called a royalty, where if you get the sole credit on the pilot and you basically are the originator of the scripted uh, television series, you may get a, an episodic royalty for every episode produced because you were sort of the original creator and that could get reduced if that ends up being shared with another person. So that's a credit bonus. And oftentimes um, you, you will bifurcate because you don't wanna get into a situation where um, it's open-ended because compared to the purchase, the purchase has to be a finite fixed amount you pay and then you own the rights, right? A credit bonus is a contractual financial obligation you're agreeing to, but it is not wrapped up in what is allowing you to acquire the rights. So the other financial consideration to think about in the next slide is the back-end compensation. So this back-end is, is drafted more along the lines of a feature. It's a net profit participation. Um, in this particular situation, we're just um, reconciling it with whatever the standard definition is of where it ultimately gets set up. So if you set it up with Disney, it's their definition. If you set it up with, with Netflix, it's their definition, so on and so forth. In TV, it's generally called MAGR, which stands for Modified Adjusted Gross. Same idea, though. Generally speaking, you kind of just get absorbed into whatever the ultimate network's definition is 
of backend MAGR. But this is a point where, um, you know, rights holders will want upside. They'll want to know that in ultimate success, they have an ultimate perpetual participation. Um, for writers, you can often start with one percentage, like 5% of sole credit, and it can get reduced if you have to credit somebody else after the fact to two and a half percent. Um, so the last slide, and this again is more tailored to writing, but you're going to want to talk about credits, right? So in this particular instance, we're talking about a writer where you're following WJ or Writers Guild standards. Um, you know, the one thing I will say is that we're, I'm talking about the terms of an option agreement. If you have a writer who's WGA Writers Guild, it has to also comply with the Writers Guild requirements. Um, and so, for example, for the Writers Guild, if you're going to do an 18-month option, the option fee has to be 10% of the purchase price. And the purchase price has to be no less than WGA scale, right? So in it, everything that I just said also has to conform with Writer Guild's rules. And that applies to writers of screenplays, pilots, so in relation to the audiovisual content. The Writers Guild does not necessarily have jurisdiction over books, plays, articles, life rights. Those are, are not subject to that jurisdiction, but the mechanics of an option and a purchase are remain the same. Now, credits for source material, article, books, life rights, etc., are also not governed by the WGA, but those would be contemplated in, in an option purchase agreement also. So for example, for a book, you would have, you know, based on the novel by, and that may vary if you end up using the same title or not as the book, or based on the life story of, or based on the article by, where they're, they're going to want that attribution and that credit for their source material. Um, one area that an option purchase agreement is a highly contested but often given concession is that your screenplay writer, your book author, you know, your rights holder may also want credit and or fees attributed in the producing capacity. You know, they may want an executive producer credit and a separate fee for that. They may want um, to be a consulting producer because their uh, script is highly technical and about the medical world and they come from that background. And even if other writers come in, they really want to be boots on the ground and integral in that. Um, somebody may have a life story that's theirs and it's really, or, or it's their, it's, they're the executor of the estate, right? It's their, their father who passed. It may be very relevant to them to be an executive producer and to maintain an ongoing and meaningful involvement. And those are all things that are negotiated and discussed. And again, with an option purchase, you're kind of getting into all of that now and you have to ensure that you're carrying along burdens that at the one yard line, when you're selling it, they're burdens that you can sell down that the studio the network, the financier is willing to agree to. Um, so another term that is a contested point and something that is very important for the rights holder on the next slide is that you'll want a first opportunity or um, the right to be involved in subsequent productions. So, you know, if you are selling a screenplay and it's and it's your baby and you made it, you'll want to know that if it's, you know, the next, um, uh, fast and furious, right? Like you have a first opportunity to write the subsequent ones. You may also want to have the, the first right to be involved to direct it or produce it. So those opportunities to render services on subsequent are often asked by the rights holder. This is a very, what I would say, like a cookie cutter um, obligation. Generally speaking, it's five to seven years. Um, generally speaking, if it's a writer, it's based on um, the writer uh, getting sole credit because obviously you don't want to be in a position as a producer where they they got pushed down, they have a shared credit, there's much more of a driving force on the creative. And then you have an obligation to the original writer who really doesn't have the capacity or capability to write the next thing. Now, along with the first opportunity to write or to direct or whatever the case may be in relation to the rights, if you go to the next slide, um, you have a passive payment. So if you're the writer and you don't write it, you have pre-negotiated passive fees for a derivative, so something that stems from the original feature film or the original TV show. You'll get a passive fee for a feature based on the television show or an unscripted show based on the television show. <clears throat> if you're a source material rights holder, so book, article, life rights, et cetera, you will also ask for passives. You know, if somebody is making, um, 
a movie about your life story, Aaron, Aaron Brockovich, and you're granting them all rights to your life forever and ever. And 15 years later, that's a series on Paramount Plus, you're going to have the expectation that you should get a passive fee in that subsequent production because it's still based on your life. Um, those nuances of like what the passive fees are do vary quite a bit um, from network to network, studio to studio and streamer to streamer. But it is relevant that when you are sort of the neutral producer trying to figure out where it ends up, that you really identify passives that you can that are digestible and palatable to the ultimate buyer, distributor, et cetera, but also something that is not an aversion for the rights holder to give you the rights. You know, it's scary to give up something forever and you get this feeling in your mind that they're going to take your rights and run with it and make a million things and they're going to get one singular purchase price. That doesn't feel really great either. So you really have to kind of balance all of those different wants and needs and desires and get to the finish line. Um, another material point to a rights holder on the next slide. Um, is reversion. So there could be a situation, and this happened quite a bit with the pandemic, where um, you pay, you have the option, you pay the purchase price, you pay $75,000. And for whatever reason, um, a global pandemic, right? Like you never know. Uh, principal photography, cameras never start rolling. Uh, rights holders want to know that like for that singular purchase price, they're not going to give it up forever if you don't actually make the thing. So this is a very typical reversion within five to seven years. If you don't start principal photography, the rights holder has an opportunity for the underlying rights to revert back, but you got to pay. You got to pay whatever the producer incurred plus interest to get those rights back. Um, Generally speaking, the measurement for reversion is principal photography for features. Um, for television, it's a little bit more layered and multifaceted. So it may be, um, you know, if a pilot's not made, it's it's three or four years. And if a first season is, is made, but they don't go into a second season, it's another five years. Um, but once they make 15 episodes to 20 episodes, that's it. There is no reversion. So TV has a, has a little bit more um, of a, of a multi-tiered approach to it, but conceptually it's the same, right? Like ultimately there could be a moment in time where the underlying rights revert back if, if the person who acquired the rights has effectively made the rights dormant. Um, so those are kind of what I would say the meat and potato provisions in an option. Um, generally when I represent clients that are very sophisticated, the dialogue around how do I present an option offer? Like you do not want to send a 30 page document because it just um, is a very difficult way to approach it. So we will often do a, an initial email that has kind of those initial bullet points we first saw outlined and just provide what the key business points are just to make sure that there's an alignment. There's a meeting of a mind. You know, if somebody wants $50,000 for a six month option and you're offering 2,500 for 24 months, you're pretty far apart, right? And it may require, um, rather than sort of a faceless email exchange, you to pick up the phone and say to the agent, you know, we really want to make this, but there's not a screenplay. Nobody really knows about this book. It's obscure. We need all this time. So what do you really care about? Well, we really care about getting at least $5,000 and we're not going to give it to you more. You know, you have to kind of converse and, and understand as a, as a producer and a business person, how do you navigate around these terms to come to a place where you can get to a meeting of the minds? And you can't simply rely on like the faceless dynamic of two lawyers talking to each other against terms because that's not how it gets done. Um, I know we're going to open up for questions just in terms of a, a cheat sheet and another thing to look at. I'm just going to run through the rest of the packet <clears throat> and then we'll open it up to questions. So if you go to the next slide, these are what I... Um, Thanks. These are what I would kind of label the standard provisions that if they're not, if they're not in your option purchase agreement, you, you're going to have to open up the document and revisit it and probably require that an amendment is made. So it's more just for your um, like, oh, I, I feel like I should make sure the waiver of injunctive relief is in there kind of thing. But what, obviously for today's purposes, we're not going to go into the, the legal meaning of everything, but just to kind of highlight them. Um, so going to the next slide, 
you're going to want, and I kind of added here the reasoning for why these provisions are so relevant. Um, well, I first, when I first started practicing, I wish somebody would have given me this chart. So it's a good cheat sheet. But basically, other things within the long form option purchase agreement that are crucial are you're going to want an indemnity so that if a claim arises from someone because they gave the rights elsewhere, you want to be protected. Um, you want to make sure that the rights holder is waiving their injunctive relief so they would not be able to enjoin or prevent the release of the picture. So that's a no injunctive relief. Um, you're gonna want to make sure that the remedies provision is to your liking. You know, Generally speaking, I would say 99.9% .9 of the studios, the production companies, the people we represent, they often will want an arbitration provision. And right now the popular one is jams. You know, When I started 15 years ago, it was AAA. I, I think certain ones go in and out of vogue, but like you do wanna have a point of view of, you know, when things go really bad and we're in litigation, is it California jurisdiction? Is it Hawaii? Is it arbitration? Is it not? And you want to make sure you, you think about that and not just kind of do whatever the boilerplate says. To the next slide. Uh, further documents is really important because copyright law may change. Other people may come into office. And so in that particular situation, you want to be able to agree that if something is in furtherance of the document, they're not gonna use that as a mechanism to renegotiate. You're gonna want the right to assign it, right? Like if you're gonna sell it to Disney, you need to be able to assign the option and have them assume those obligations. Um, this credit language is uh, to protect you when people make mistakes and they do, and you forget to put their credit in, as long as you fix it, you're not gonna be in material breach of the agreement where they're gonna sue you for a million dollars because you know, they forgot to list you in the in the artwork or something like that. Obviously, it doesn't excuse bad behavior, but it forgives mistakes, if, if that makes sense. Um, and then the the rights, this is this is a more of a work for hire. So this last provision is a little bit more skewed to engaging a writer to write something as a work for hire, as opposed to the rights that we talked about in the option, which are more of a grant of rights. So it's a little distinctive, but either way, you got to make sure within the document you're owning whatever you need to own, whether it's a work for hire or a grant of rights. Um, and that is the presentation right on time. Um, so I guess we'll open it up for questions. Michael, you're gonna ask? Yes, so okay. first and foremost, thank you so much. Not only were you on time, you were like so elegant with so much of that work that was on, on screen. Uh, initially when I saw those slides, I was like, <gasps> But uh, he moves through it really elegantly and in a way that uh, I'm, I'm sure that our participants really got it. So we have one question. And then what I wanted to do perhaps is kind of role play with you um, yeah. in a couple of situations to ground the information based on who I know are graduates of our program to be. So the question is, is there something similar to a setup bonus, but for family members of the estate of the life rights that are being optioned? And then the same person came back and said, I think you may have answered the question with the passive payment section. So if I were to read that, my assumption would be that if, if a if state owns life rights of someone, that estate would, would, in a sense, be the rights holder and they would need to option the property from them. So they would certainly get an option and obviously passive income uh, based on the execution and or the exploitation of those life rights, correct? Yeah, well, for the for the family member, um, it's generally not a setup bonus, but what often will happen is the family member will say, look, it's it's my my dad's legacy. It's really important for me to be involved and and. I'm an executor of an estate, but it's also my sisters, my brothers, my cousins. So I want to be paid individually for my time. So that doesn't necessarily convert in a setup bonus, but what it may convert into is like a consultant fee or a producing fee that you actually segregate from the rights fee itself. So that would be a separate fee in order to potentially help protect the, you know, the, 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 uh, the integrity of the life story that's being optioned or something. Yeah. Or or potentially to provide provide nuance to the story that's being told because of your connection to to the estate. Yeah, and it could even be it could be expertise, it could be window, it could be in order to exercise your consultation rights. You're going to have to read scripts and take meetings and things like that. So it's kind of it's kind of all or some of the above, depending on what the situation is. Great. So now I'm going to role play. So I'm a young screenwriter. Uh, most of the graduates of our program are doing their first or second feature 
uh, typically the budgets of these pro, uh, projects range anywhere between $30,000 to $400,000 all in, and they're typically in the, uh, in independently produced and then distributed by, you know, we enter them in film festivals or a, a distributor will get a sense, we'll hear about the picture and sort of follow it and pick it up once it's done. So is the one to 3% purchase price a good window as to what eyes a you know, nascent screenwriter should expect um, in, in a purchase price of a screenplay? Um, yes and no. I, I think that when you're that low budget, I, I would say under a million, right? right? It's good to kind of first accept what is WJ scale. And, and reverse engineer it to the practical realities of how much money there is. And the reason that that's relevant is that, you know, if, if you're a writer, writer, director, especially, right. Yeah, Where it's like, this is, the next, this is the next three years of your life. Right. You can say like, look, I understand it. There's not a lot of money and I don't want to raise more capital. I want to make this thing. But what you may figure out with your producing partners and, and as you're setting it up is that maybe you take a 10 or 15 or $20,000 fee now, right? So that like you can pay for your cell phone bill, right? Like that kind of stuff. And you say like in success, um, before everybody gets their back end, I, I want a deferment after the equity before the, that, that gets me at least WJ scale, right? Like that may, and by the way, the WGA low budget, so under 1.2 has that mechanism. Right. Um, the WJ low budget says you can pay, I, I think it's like 10, it changes every few years, but it's like you pay $10,000. And then at the point in which you make it, you are obligated to pay the writer up to scale. Um, and, it, and it has to tie out if the director gets an earlier break point, so does the writer. So I do find, particularly on the lower budget side, using the WGA and the DGA guidelines is helpful for you to articulate what's fair and get to a good solution. Great, now let's flip it from the producer standpoint. So I'm a producer and uh, this is my first or second, uh, I've produced one or two independent motion pictures and uh, as you all well know, uh, some producers may carry the script in their bag for three years trying to set it up, right? Um, what would be, you know, uh, and again, in this budget range, what sort of range for an option do you think um, I should pay for um, from a young screenwriter uh, that I wanna be able to go out and help set up or, or have an, enough of a window so I can knock into onto as many doors as possible to finance the, the low budget, uh, micro budget film? Well, if your path is ultimately micro budget, you can look into the attachment agreement. I'm only hesitant about that because I do think it's important for the writer to know what they're getting themselves into. Like if you're really going to make this for 400 grand, you got to know your writer's going to take whatever it is. So I, I, one recommendation is, is you utilize the concept of a setup bonus. So you say, look, I don't have much money, but I'm going to spend a hundred hours trying to put this together. Give me a free option for 12 months. Right. And I've actually done a lot of deals like this where it's like, look, there's a version of this where I make it for under 500,000. And if I do, you agree to 25,000 and 10% back, whatever that number is, right? And, and you can even have what I would call like the lever, right? Where it's like, if it ends up being more than 500,000 or a million dollars on starter principle, then I agree you can renegotiate. Perfect. Maybe entirely, maybe, maybe partly, um, but that's a way to give protection. And that's something I've had to do with people with, that are really hesitant, that like are a little paranoid that like they're going to walk it into Disney and then just completely leave money on the table. So it's a risk for the producer, but it may be a way to give them assurances that you're really going down a particular path. And if it goes elsewhere in good faith, everyone will roll up their sleeves and figure it out. Right. Like a and again, with the, with the legal term of in good faith, right? That's the... Yeah. That's, yeah, know, knowing the people that you're going to be working with well enough to know that should, you know, because as you all know, when big money, well, I don't want to say big money, but, you know, if our fellows are used to $400,000 or less, you know, that making sure that everyone's on board should bigger money come in to that, that everyone will play nicely and work in good faith to make it happen because at the end of the day, everyone wins, right? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Another question just came in. Aloha. Could you cover role? Uh, role play questions issues i need to know as a producer for a situation comedy with co-writers i want to grant our professional comedian writers the ability to improv and then uh, uh, okay so all right let me read that again so could you cover 
the role. Okay, I think I know what this is. So this is one of our fellows who is looking to produce a, um, I'm not sure if it's gonna be a web series or some sort of television series or a web series can be shot and then potentially roll over into a television series. But what is, uh, when a producer, creator slash producer is working with actors who are going to provide some of the material um, in, in an improv kind of situation, right? Uh, that will make it into the final cut of the project. What sort of protections should the should uh, the creator slash producer and the actors who are uh, who are going to do improv um, have to make sure that they're ad adequately protected and compensated? I mean, generally speaking, an an actor or improv within the construct of your IP, your episode should be done on a work for hire pay basis. So they really shouldn't retain any ownership of it. Um, and, and comedy is a, is a weird one because there could be overlap between their act and what they're doing on improv, but it becomes very gray. Like there has to be sort of a consensus that whatever they're doing on screen is yours and you own it. Now, now you may agree that you only own it in context of the show, that you can't repackage that and use it to make another thing, right? And But that's more of a give for a comedian that you wouldn't necessarily do. Um, I, I will say which it's interesting because that's distinctive from music where sometimes we've had actresses that are like very well-known musicians or singers and they are going to sing on camera a song that they own. Well, that that would be done under a license probably. Oh, but right. the, the improv thing, ideally you would want to house it as work for hire or you're just going to give yourself a world of a, a headache. Hurt. Yeah, so in other words, what, what this creator producer would do is she would create some sort of work for hire agreement with these comedians who would work on the show that she's creating and then potentially have some sort of back end with them to mitigate whatever else may happen uh, beyond that to keep everyone happy. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Um, then the other question that she mentions, are there any major nuances that as a, uh, as a producer, I should know be between a, a streaming contract and a broadcast contract? Huh. I think yeah, it's a whole are, other hour. Yeah, it's a whole other. I was just going to say, those are two so different worlds because one it, pays residuals, one doesn't. Uh, what format is it? And yeah. Yeah. And by the way, not even necessarily there are streamers that are doing hybrid backends that are a little bit more traditional. Um, but the thing that has come up quite a bit is that a lot of people that have like older than two year option agreements mm -hmm. um, agree to give net profit or MAGR. And what now rights holders are sophisticated about is they want a built-in conversion. Okay, well, you know, I agree to 5% net, but if you go to Netflix and it's a streamer and they pay a premium, how does that convert? And so that is a very new area and landscape, but it is a conversation that is going to, people are going to have to get more comfortable having. Got it. Um, then the other question is, uh, let's see, um, I had, uh, any concrete first steps advice for a screenwriter who is interested in optioning a book um, to write as a script on spec uh, to then shop around to, and attach producers? I think, uh, I think you went through it in the presentation, but it's primarily be treated from the standpoint of being able to get it for a certain period of time and then be able to agree to some sort of purchase price so that when the rights are transferred to a producer or a buyer, they, they've pre, been pre-negotiated, correct? <clears throat> yeah, I would say even before any of that, like do your homework, right? So if you're interested in a book, I would, you know, see if it does the publisher have the rights? Do they have a sophisticated agent? Um, look in the copyright office to see if you can see if anyone else has optioned it, you know, do Google searches and see. Um, and I think that it's particularly if you're a screenwriter writing it on spec, sometimes just the human element of trying to engage with the author directly is your best bet because they're they're going to either respond to you and believe in you and then be open to it. Or you may get the gatekeeper to say, we're not even going to take a call unless you send us an offer. And so you kind of got to figure out what you're dealing with on the other side. And then from there, figure out, you know, is it a shopping agreement where if I make the screenplay in the first year, we'll go into a full-fledged option or is it something else? Got it. Those are all the questions that we have time for. Thank you so much, Elsa. Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, next Wednesday, uh, Attorney Tiffany Acosta will be presenting in collaboration agreements. The webinar is scheduled for Wednesday, June 23rd at 1 p.m.
please see creativelab.hawaii.gov uh, for registration information. Again, mahalo to Elsa for spending the last hour with us and on behalf of the state of Hawaii DBED Creative Industries Division and our co-sponsor, California Lawyer for the Arts, mahalo and have a great evening.